I hear children at play Memories come from far away Taking me, holding my hand To the playground wonderland Thank you, Tony Bennett. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in the playground, most of it on the monkey bars. All of my friends were there, the entire school was there, the whole neighborhood, in fact, was there, and it was fun. And no, I didn't break any bones. But playgrounds now aren't what they used to be. The structures that defined those spaces, where we played, exercised, what was once really our social network, are being carted off to the junkyard nowadays to be replaced with more modern, ostensibly safer play spaces. The monkey bars, the metal slides that you went whizzing down to shoot off the bottom, landing on your bottom more times than not. The seesaws, remember when your partner suddenly got up and wham, you hit the ground. And all of the other ways we played are few and far between these days, but they live on in fond memory, unless you were bullied there, and in a new coffee table book immortalizing them. Once Upon a Playground, a celebration of classic American playgrounds, 1920 to 1975, is a collection of more than 200 images by photographer Brenda Biondo. And for your ears only, she joins us now to talk about the book and 100 years of playground culture. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. What led you to do a book on playgrounds? Well, about 10 years ago, I was at a park near where I live in Colorado with my daughter, who was about a year old at the time, and while she was playing in the sand, I was looking around at the playground equipment that they had there. It was just a little structure with some plastic slides and a little monkey bar and maybe a little tiny bridge, and I started thinking and wondering, you know, where is the great playground equipment? I remember from when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, where are those metal slides and the wooden seesaws and the spinning merry-go-rounds. And so I started looking around at other nearby parks to see if I could find some of this equipment, and I realized very quickly that this equipment is disappearing really fast. There's very little of it left. And I thought that was a shame because... So many generations of Americans have grown up playing on this equipment. They have such fond memories. It's part of the cultural history of the country. It's a part of Americana, yet there's hardly any of it left. And so I decided I was going to try and document and photograph as many pieces of equipment that I could still find that were out there before they were gone or were gone forever. Well, let's go back. Where, why, and for what kind of kids was the playground first conceived and created? They became popular in this country in the early 1900s in the inner cities where there were a lot of immigrant children, a lot of people living close together. And they started as a way to get these city kids off of the dangerous streets where they're getting hit by cars and carriages and and getting in trouble also. And they decided, well, we'll build these playgrounds and the kids will have a safe place to play, but we'll also have a chance to work with immigrant children, newly arrived children, to teach them a little bit more about American culture and teamwork and how to work together and customs. Um, So there was a really uh, unique interest in having playgrounds in the early 1900s. And what about today? Do most kids have access to a modern or renovated playground today? Uh, Not really. Uh, More than half of kids don't, in this country, don't have a playground within walking distance of their home. And talk about the reason the equipment is changing form, uh, why the, 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 the classic old pieces are, are being removed. Well, there's a number of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is because there's this feeling among some people who are responsible for, for playgrounds in schools and parks that if they have this old equipment they, that may not meet current guidelines, they might be uh, you know, setting themselves up for litigation. They might be concerned that parents look at this uh, equipment and say, well, geez, it hasn't been replaced in 40 years. Don't don't you think we should get some new stuff? So there's a whole bunch of different reasons why it's being replaced. Obviously, some of it is just been there for decades, so some of it is falling apart. But some of it's just taken out for really no good reason. The book is made up of mostly photos you shot. How long did it take you to find the shots you needed, and how far did you have to travel? Well, I took photographs over a period of about eight years, and I I tried to get to as many states as I could. Obviously, I started in the southwest where I live, so I went to Arizona, New Mexico, 
in Colorado, but I, you know, I went out to California, to Virginia, to Pennsylvania, really as many places as I could get to because I wanted to see what was still there. And it was frustrating in a lot of ways because I'd, be, I'd drive around for hours and hours stopping in all the little towns that I came across, and so often there would be nothing left of these old pieces of equipment, or uh, sometimes there would be uh, a new structure that obviously was just installed within the last year, and then it would make me think, well, what was here before that? And even when people would tell me, oh, well, there's I just drove through this town, and there's this great rocket ship, you have to go take a picture... I'd go to those towns sometimes, and by the time I'd get there, maybe a couple months later, a piece that was there just, you know, earlier in the year would have, was gone. Writer and photographer Brenda Biondo, her work has appeared in the Washington Post, Denver Post, USA Weekend, and other publication. A portion of the royalties of Once Upon a Playground will be donated to national playground nonprofit Kaboom. To the playground wild. 